It's a 2 litre turbo hatchback I bought for 17,000 AUD and for comparison it's on par with the i30N as well as other modern performance cars but less than half the price. This French baguette may not be the most popular hatchback going around but it's super responsive when stock and even better with bolt-ons and the right tune. My Megan RS made a safe 269 horsepower over the 250 horsepower stock figure. I could have easily pushed 350 horsepower if I wanted to spend a bit more on better engine cooling and a tune. But I didn't, and I never will. That's because I finally made the hard decision to part ways with my Renault Megane RS250. I sold it to another Renault enthusiast who can hopefully push it to its limits and drive it as intended because I just did not. On this channel, I've spoken so highly of the Megane RS platform, so this news may come as a shock to some. The reality is I barely drove it and I needed to make room for another incomplete project because modifying the Megan RS was not on the cards. I could end the video there, but there is a deeper reason which may not make sense to most people. This will also be an unpopular opinion amongst those European car lovers, and I'm willing to accept that this is more of a problem with me rather than the European cars, but you can be the judge, so leave a comment below. So let me take you back to just before I made the purchase and this would all start to make sense. It was early 2021 when I started looking at performance cars and I'm sure everyone remembers what the time was actually like. We were locked up in our homes for an entire year and I hadn't even thought about cars for some time. I was eager to get behind the wheel of something fun so I started shopping for a Honda S2000 as I had previously sold one for less than $20,000 years prior. And yeah, that was definitely not going to be an option. So I started to look at other vehicles that may be in budget for less than $20,000. I had seen two i30Ns in 2020 selling for around the 25K mark, so I fixated on them as I really liked how they drove. In a period of three months, I managed to get a fair bit of seat time in an i30N, and that may or may not have been wasting dealerships time, but I made the decision to buy one. Only problem was, I had to wait for one to drop in my price range, and of course, the complete opposite started to happen. The i30N fell victim to new car price gouging because of long wait times on new models, which drove up the used car prices by almost 20%. So, I had to go back to the drawing board. I started to look at other options under 20K, such as Ford's ST, Subaru's WRX, and even Mitsubishi's Colt Rally Art. But these options didn't stand out for me or give me the same satisfaction the i30N could. The WRX was fun, but I don't really trust turbo boxer engines, which I think YouTubers are to blame for shining such a bad light, mostly by making out that they are the most unreliable cars ever made. I'm looking at you, Donut Media. So I honestly couldn't bring myself to purchase a Subaru. I didn't even look at or test drive any European performance cars because from what I understand, they are not as reliable and are more expensive to maintain in Australia than our local brands or JDM or KDM vehicles. Plus, at the time, I'd only ever owned and completed minor maintenance on Japanese cars such as Isuzu, Toyota and Honda. So that's all I knew and trusted. People around me didn't help either with my decision because friends who owned Euros complained about part and service costs on a regular basis because shit just kept going wrong with their cars. I even avoided indirect Euro design cars such as the Honda Civic FN2R because they are also known to be not as easy to work on as other model Civics as everything's just packed so tight and things are hard to access which seem to be a common trend for Euro cars. But here I am searching for a car and nothing is standing out. However, multiple Megan RSs would continue to pop up for less than $20,000. Every time I searched, one would pop up, and I couldn't help but take fascination in the style of the pre-facelift model RS. It took me weeks pondering before I finally said, you know what, fuck it. I broke my rule and I started to conduct some poorly executed research to consider purchasing, yes, a European car. A quick Google search and I found myself on a UK Renault forum, which so happened to include constant praising of the Megane RS, promoting its reliability, availability of parts for a fair price, 
and how accessible everything is in the engine bay. At that point, I was literally that meme that says shut up and take my money. Looking back at it now, I laugh at my stupid decision making based on literally no evidence. I guess being locked up in my house for an entire year really screwed with my brain. I started shopping for a Megane RS that week and on my first test drive of a stock RS250, I was almost hooked. It took about three test drives of different RS models until I landed on a modified RS250, which would pop and bang. And for some reason that was still a selling point at my age. But what really sold it was the drive was almost identical to the i30N. So I made the purchase and the rest was history. Now we enter the turning point. I started to realize why I had a no Euro car rule in the first place. The week I purchased the car, I took it for a full service and check over, which resulted in my mechanic opening the floodgates to my car anxiety. Although the car was well maintained with a full service history, my mechanic was just not a fan of some newer Euros, but mainly French vehicles, and that's for good reason. He made that point very clear as he nitpicked all the faults and upcoming large ticket maintenance items as well as slapping on his inflated price because in his words, this car is a bitch to work on. That list would include fixing the rocket cover oil leak costing $2,000, replacing the clutch and belts costing $5,000, replacing the drive shaft seals costing $2,500, and not to mention the long list of common issues which could possibly add up to the cost of ownership in the long run. This was not the type of introduction to European cars I was after because it basically solidified why I avoided them in the first place. And I'll tell you, it felt f***ing shit. In a very short time, I went from being super excited about my purchase to feeling like a complete noob who bought a lemon. Instead of selling though, to cut my losses, I decided to buy some tools and start tackling the maintenance list in my garage, which resulted in the creation of this YouTube channel. On the bright side, if I didn't purchase this Megane, then this channel probably would have never existed. Spending a couple of grand on equipment, including some special tools for the Megane, which are now useless because no other car I work on need them, but I managed to fix the rocket cover oil leak and then later tackled the drive shaft seal, which started leaking. In doing all this, I got a real taste of how much parts actually costed because they were all imported from Europe. Parts like the drive shaft seal costed me $150 locally and not much cheaper if I purchased it directly from Europe. I couldn't get my head around the cost of this tiny rubber ring because the same part for my Honda Civic was $120 cheaper and it looked like it used the same amount of rubber. But anyway, that's just how it is when owning a European car apparently. Once those items were out of the way, I still had to consider the clutch and belts, which I couldn't even DIY in my garage. Apparently I needed a hoist, more tools and more people because the workshop would normally remove the engine to complete the job in a timely manner and to be honest, I'm not that experienced to even try. Now, another thing that bothered me was the possibility of any unforeseen common issues occurring on my vehicle. And there is a very long list of stuff that could go wrong some that had already been fixed by the previous owner. This became quite overwhelming and resulted in the car just sitting around as I loved looking at it more than I liked driving it. When I did drive it though, I would think about all the chances of breakdown, plus the cost and time it would take to fix. But normally if I didn't hear any weird noises, I'd forget all about that because the car is very fun to drive. I mentioned earlier that modifying the Megane was off the cards because I feared it would speed up the process of mechanical failure, even after being told by my tuner it could handle 350 horsepower easily, I just really wasn't willing to try. It also didn't help that every Every Australian Magan RS video which got recommended to me on YouTube ended with something negative about the long-term ownership of the car. Although the Megane RS is unreal to drive and one car that will be missed, I'm actually quite happy to part ways as driving it stressed me out so much every time I heard that new noise. It may sound like I hate European cars, but that's actually far from the truth because I'm not sure all European cars are subject to the same circumstances. There was a period of time where I came to terms with the Megane RS and I even made some very positive videos regarding my ownership and I don't retract them at all.
Going forward, I think I've learned a thing or two about comprehensive pre-purchase inspections and doing better research, including questions to groups on forums or verbal conversations with mechanics before buying a vehicle. And that's Euro or not. So now my Megan RS journey is over and I'm starting to introduce new projects to the channel. For those diehard Renault fans who are subscribed, I do apologize for betraying you, but in the end, the Megane RS served its purpose, and now I'm in the market for a new car which aligns with my previous purchases of the past. And I'll give you a hint, it does not start with an S. And make sure you follow my channel so you can keep up to date with all my new videos. Thanks.